Last Sunday, we had a special offering, if you'll recall. If you were here last week, uh, we shared with you a special need. Uh, it was a surprise one. It's with our missionaries that are in Uganda. They're from our church family, the Actuses, and uh, their car basically exploded. And so in order for them to keep doing ministry, to get out to the mission, to the villages that they uh, that work in, to get to the schools they've established that we've helped them start, uh, they need transportation. And so um, they could get a car for about 15000 Now, I will tell you, I misspoke last week. I thought we needed to raise all 15000 I went back and read the email, and we only needed to raise 10000 Okay? So here's the good news. We raised $12,500 last Sunday. All right? So that is terrific. You all were wonderful. You were very generous. Now, when I say 12005 that was what came in and what was pledged. Okay? So if you're one of the pledgers, get it in. Okay? <laughs> By next Sunday. Uh, well, no, actually, you got two more weeks. We said by the end of the month, okay? By the end of the month, so they can have that car ready to go by Easter there, all right? So thank you so much. But you all were very, very generous, and we appreciate that so much. Let me draw your attention to the screen to our uh, welcome and morning announcements. Good morning, and welcome to New Hope Community Church. We're glad you're here to worship with us this morning. If you are visiting with us today, Please take one of our connection cards in the pew in front of you, fill it out, and let us know about yourself. We won't knock on your door, but we will send you more information about the opportunities here at New Hope. If you worship here with us regularly, please let us know your prayer concerns, and we will consider those on Tuesday mornings when we meet as a staff. Thank you for being here, and we hope that you experience God in a special way this morning. Men, we're starting a new Bible study on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. That starts March 26th, and it'll be in the office classroom. So if you're ready to delve into the Bible, come and join us on Tuesday nights, 7 p.m. Hi, I'm Erica. I'm Alex. Hi, I'm Alex. Hi, I'm Cheyenne. And I'm John. Reminder, the pie auction is coming up on March 24th at 5.30 p.m. Donations can be dropped off at church on the 24th. Or at 5 p.m. before the auction. Also, we need prayer. Prayer for our training. Our travels. And for all the people we're serving on this mission. Ask God to work in our hearts and through our hands. For more information about how you can get involved, contact Teddy Miller or Brittany Latrell. Ladies, for those of you that purchased your love t-shirts, they have arrived. We're out in the pavilion today handing them out, so come on out and pick yours up. Our kids are preparing for their Palm Sunday Easter Choir performance. The rehearsals start March 10th, and they're at 11 a.m. in the office. And this is for pre-K through sixth grade kids. So if you'd like your kids to perform in the Easter Choir, rehearsals start at 11. Easter is just around the corner, and that means Easter Choir practices. They started last Thursday night at 6.30, right here in the sanctuary. If you were not able to attend last Thursday, I hope you will be there next Thursday. 6.30, I'm looking for 40 people to add their voices to our Easter Choir this year. I hope you'll come and join us. Hey guys, see that big rig behind the dumpster? That means work is starting on the barn project. They came out and took soil samples and did compaction tests. Exciting stuff. I like that music on this one. All right, that was kind of fun. All right, uh, got some sign-up sheets coming around. There are three things on the clipboard today. All right, the one on top is for men. This is for the Tuesday night Bible study that Mark will be teaching and starting just a week from this coming Tuesday. Uh, Mark, Pastor Mark is going to be teaching on the gospel of Mark. Mark on Mark, all right? So, guys, uh, sign up. Uh, there's uh, a book that goes with this, so he wants to make sure he has enough material there. The uh, second sign-up sheet is about church work day. If you're going to be able to be here on, uh, it's Saturday, I think, the 30th. Uh, I think I shared with you last week, it's the first work day in 28 years that I won't be there. How will you get any work done? 
You will because Teddy Miller is in charge, all right, as he was last year. And so we just want to know how, about how many to have. We always have uh, donuts and some snacks here for the day, and we want to be prepared. And so uh, if you would sign up, that would be terrific. And then uh, the last sheet is uh, if you have uh, interest in serving the church as a deacon, uh, deacons help with communion and baptism and setups for special events and other projects. You just want to know more about it. This is not a commitment, but you want to know more about it. There will be an informational meeting. Is that next Sunday? No. Uh, it's at 11 o'clock on April the 7th. All right, so a few weeks away, 11 o'clock, and uh, they'd love for you to sign up so they have enough material for you as well. Let me highlight just a couple of things. First off, Easter choir is going really good. Do you know how many we have signed up? 41. <laughs> 41. Okay, now, now hold on. I'm not satisfied yet. Okay? I want 43 or 44 only because I know that two or three of you will end up being sick, all right? It happens at every, every Christmas or every Easter. So in order to have 40 that day, we need about 43 or 44. So just because we've hit it, don't say, oh, good, the pressure's off of me. Yeah. Pressure's still on. Okay, where's Milo? Oh, I got, I got books we can Oh, you got, all right, here we go. You got the music and you got some, you'll get CDs I to get them. CDs all right, all right. So right now there is uh, 15 men and 26 women, Okay. So, 41, it's doing good, and that's even after two people dropped out, okay? So, so, so we're hanging in there, we're doing good, I'm, pastor's smiling, all right? We're doing good there. So, uh, but they'd love to have you, rehearsals are uh, on Thursday evening, 6.30, and uh, guess what next Sunday night is? Pie auction, not tonight, next Sunday night. Get out those best recipes. We need you for two things. We need you to bring the items that we auction off. It doesn't have to be a dessert. It can be a casserole. Uh, you know, Dad has done chicken. I think Dad's through with chicken and dumplings, but, you know, you can do things like that. Whatever your best dish is, bring it. We're going to auction it off. If you're in business and want to bring something from your business that would be a good auction item, uh, I was told last week that we're going to get a certificate for a garage door or garage door opener and installation, all right, to donate. And so there'll be some unusual things we've not had before. So that's exciting. And for those of you who are new to New Hope, this is our fundraiser for our high school, junior high, Mexico mission trip and project. Uh, they raise funds, which by primarily covers the expense of our students who are going, and then we have this project to raise the funds for the construction and all the other expenses. And then if we take in more money than we need for that, we use it in the other, we use it in other areas of missions or youth work. All right? And so our goal is to raise uh, $20,000 uh, uh, next Sunday night. Uh, over the last four or five years, we've raised anywhere from eighteen to 27000 on our pie auction night. So uh, we need you to bring the items, and then we need you to show up at 530 to buy those things that you have donated. All right? Uh, bring guests. Bring visitors with you. It is not a church service. It's not you know, we pray and then we get busy and uh, we hope to be finished by, by about 7.30. All right, so come and join us next Sunday evening for that event. Uh, <clears throat> I already mentioned the cleanup day. Let me move to some prayer requests. Um, Virginia Zumwalt used to attend our church. Health reasons has prevented Virginia from being here for a while. I got a call from her this week and uh, found out that her son John Kellogg had passed away with a heart attack. He was, uh, he was in his 50s. And so uh, they're working on plans for a service probably going to be in April, but would appreciate you remembering the Zumwalt Kellogg family. And then uh, Sharon Frame, and uh, she has sung in our, in our Christmas choir in the past. I think she's even in our Easter choir this year. Uh, she helped serve yesterday at the memorial service we had at the church, and that's where I found out that uh, her 57-year-old son had had a massive heart attack up in Portland, Oregon. He was being kept alive by equipment and wanted us to remember to pray for him. She stopped by on her way out of town today to let us know that he had passed away during the night. So if you'd remember Sharon and their family, her son's name was Kevin Grand. We've had a few, uh, a few surgeries this week. Uh, Gloria Swint had neck and back surgery. She is home recuperating. Please continue to pray for her as, uh, as, as she recovers and recuperates. Pam Jarvis uh, had knee replacement surgery yesterday. 
Uh, Shelly said her doctor showed up in golf shorts and golf shirt, that when he finished, he was going golfing, all right, since it was Saturday. You love it when a doctor's that calm before surgery, all right? It's very reassuring. But uh, she came through surgery just uh, beautifully, and she's doing well. She'll be going home tomorrow. Uh, and so please take note of others. that we've, um, I've never known of so many twins, all right, at one time. But um, uh, the, the Logans, all right, they, uh, they've had twins in their family, all right, grandkids, uh, a, a grandson and a granddaughter, all right. And uh, they came a little bit early, uh, but the, the, the biggest one, uh, which I believe is the girl, is four pounds seven ounces, somewhere in that neighborhood. And the younger one, the smaller one, the little boy, is two pounds, eight ounces, all right? So they are both at Fresno Community Hospital, and they're getting rave reviews of the care that they're getting there at the hospital. Uh, but they're doing very, very well, though they were born prematurely. So we're grateful for the good news of what's going on there. Uh, we have, um, in fact, she's not in church with us today. She had been the last two weeks. Um, Ari, thank you very much. Ari Thomas, I married him. You think I'd remember the name? Uh, Ari Thomas, it's uh, Kim Hashimoto's daughter, is expecting twins. She needs to carry those twins minimally six more weeks, all right, to make the doctors happy. Ten would be ideal. Uh, yesterday, she was having contractions uh, every seven minutes. So uh, she's confined to bed rest right now. Uh, and so she will not be getting out for a few more weeks. So remember her as she carries those little babies. And then uh, we have another lady in our church who is carrying twins as a surrogate mother, all right? So that's the third set of twins. And so she is also on home rest at the moment, needs to carry a little bit longer. So I uh, would appreciate you remembering all of these. And that's not the only pregnant folks we have in our church either, all right? There's a few more. They're just not carrying twins, all right? Uh, so anyway, just be remembering to pray for each other. Uh, and then uh, Brian and Tisha Borchardt. Uh, yesterday was the memorial service here at New Hope for their son. He was 24 years old. He was shot and killed a couple of weekends ago over off of Highway 99. And that service was here. Packed house yesterday. Uh, I want to say thank you to our volunteers here who volunteered for setup and serving and cleanup. You did a wonderful job yesterday. You ministered to that family very, very much. Uh, they were expecting uh, 125 to 150 people, and they were about 210 who were here for that service. Um, uh, Dad gave a strong statement of faith during the service and even provided free books about uh, faith in Jesus Christ uh, for any of the guests who wanted to take them. So it was a wonderful testimony to, to Christ yesterday. But if you'd remember, Brian and Tisha, they joined us for church last Sunday, and they said we would see them at 11 o'clock today. Uh, they have a younger son, Riley. Riley's an eighth grader at Clark uh, middle school. When I found that out, when I met with a family, and I said, Riley, where, where do you go to junior high? And he said, Clark. And I said, oh, do you, did you ever have Linda Brope? She's in our church. She's in our 8 o'clock service for a teacher. The smile left his face. <laughs> I told this to Linda earlier, all right? Smile left his face. He said, yeah. He said, she's tough. <laughs> <laughs> Linda visited with him yesterday, and so she said, they said, no, they would be here today. So just be remembering to pray for their family as they go through this, this very, very challenging time. So uh, you saw there's, there's things beginning to happen with the barn project. All right, thank you. Your, your, your pledges are coming in every single week, so we're so grateful for that. And uh, we, we still hope that this summer we're going to be fully breaking ground and getting started with things. Uh, let's just pray that we don't hit any major hiccups as we go through those final stages with the county. Uh, we certainly want favor with them. I'm being very nice to them. Uh, Steve Drake's being very nice to them. And so uh, anyway, uh, we, we hope we continue to do well in that process. Well, I'm going to ask our ushers to prepare to wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Uh, gentlemen, if you would come and would you join with me as we pray? Uh, Father, we're so grateful for the beauty of this day. We're grateful for the opportunity to be alive and to experience all that you have in store for us today. Um, Lord, most of us had worship today as part of our agenda. We wanted to acknowledge who you are and what you've done on our behalf. And, um, 
But there may be things that transpire today that were not in our plans. But whatever may catch us by surprise uh, or catch us unprepared will not catch you by surprise. You are prepared for it, and you are ready to be all in all in us as we face the, the circumstances of this day. Lord, uh, we lift up those that we have mentioned that have been through surgeries this week and just continue to trust you for their recovery and their recuperation. Lord, Ron Cross is in service with us today, and he's going to be having heart surgery later this week. We lift up his needs to you. Thank you for what you're doing in and through his life. And I pray between now and Thursday that he will experience your peace that passes all human understanding. The kind of surgery he's going to be having ought to make us uh, uh, on pins and needles. But Father, I pray that he will experience the kind of tranquility and peace that comes knowing that you're big enough for what he faces, both in the waiting as well as in the surgery and the recovery afterwards. We pray for the needs of his family, Lord. Uh, the waiting room is often the most challenging place in a hospital where uh, you know nothing that's going on, and yet your peace can transcend all those circumstances. And so we pray for an abundance of that. Lord, there are those in our church who are uh, unemployed, wanting to be employed, and uh, we pray for them. Uh, Lord, I pray for the opportunities that will come, that, uh, that they will go to the right places. They'll be sensitive to the, the right opportunities that come up. And Lord, I'm confident we have some folks in our congregation who are very employed that would love to be unemployed. And so we just pray for peace and contentment until retirement comes. And then even in those stages, we trust that there will be that great sense of peace as you provide every single day for what our needs are. Lord, for, um, for these, these mamas who are, are delivering babies, some that need to carry these children just a little bit longer, we commit to you their needs. We pray for your very best. Thank you for, um, for NICU nurses and doctors with these specialties that uh, step in, in in these unexpected circumstances. And we thank you for all that they've done. And, and, and we thank you most of all for the provisions that you make. We trust you with our needs today, Lord. Last week we rejoice over, uh, over men and women who gave their life to Christ. And I pray that they have been encouraged in their faith during this week. And Lord, whatever you want to do in our service today, may you find us ready, willing, and able. Lord, I, um, I apologize a little bit for being really personal on my last prayer today. And um, Father, at this moment, um, my oldest son in Oklahoma is preaching a message for the very first time. And so, Lord, for what you have worked into his heart this week, I pray that he will give you the freedom to speak clearly through him that he'll recognize it's not his ability, it's not his, um, his mental capabilities that are important in a moment like this, but it is, it is his heart's trust in you to do in and through him what it is that you want to speak and say to that church today. So we just pray for both the speaker and Lord, I pray for the hearers. Uh, may they be kind to him and smile a lot. And uh, we just trust you for your best outcomes. For this and so much more, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Good job. I invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 5. We're going to be reading from there in just a couple of minutes. Luke, uh, Luke chapter 5. Um, Cecil Spurlock told me a quick uh, joke in the hallway today uh, in the aisle of church. Let me see if I can retell it uh, just from memory. It's appropriate since it's St. Patrick's Day, and this happened in Ireland, okay? And by the way, uh, I can take no credit for the planning of wearing green today. It is my wife, who has absolutely nothing green on, that said to me last night, you are wearing green tomorrow, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, she's holding a green pen. Yeah, she is. And she thinks her eyes are green, all right? So... Um, so, <laughs> so, so anyway, it would be appropriate because uh, th this, uh, a gentleman was sitting outside an Irish pub and he was fishing in a puddle of water. And a gentleman comes by and he says, what are you doing? And the guy says, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm fishing. And he said, well, come on in with me and let's have a beer. And so he says, okay. So he goes in and they have a couple of beers together and uh, the gentleman looks at him and he said, um, can I just ask you another question? He said, sure. He said, uh, how many fish were you catching? And he looked at him and he said, 
you're number five. You're <laughs> okay. There's, there's my Irish joke for the day, all right? And it, it does fit with the sermon today. Uh, actually, you can thank Pops for today's sermon. Uh, he inspired it earlier this week. Uh, he came by, and it was one of these beautiful afternoons, and he said, boy, this would be a good day to go fishing. Of course, not, most of you know, Dad is now 93. He cannot go to the San Joaquin River anymore and fish, all right? Or we would be fishing him out of the river, all right? Uh, so in just a couple of weeks, Joe Avila will have his boat up at Shaver, and we'll be able to get him back up there and out. But uh, in his younger days, on days like we're having right now, four or five days out of the week, Dad at four o'clock would head up to the river, and, uh, and he would fish, and he would often bring dinner home for him and Mom. And uh, so anyway, that inspired me along the lines of what we've been talking about on Sunday mornings anyway has been sharing our faith with others, okay? It's been about if, 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 if as Christians, not Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, or New Hopians, but as children of God, men and women who say we've had this personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And if you're new today, what I mean by being a Christian is, is, is not any more complicated. It's, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's simple because it's not about works, good deeds, a list of do's and don'ts. It's about one thing and one thing only, that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. This, this Easter celebration that we're thinking about inviting some bunnies to, uh, this Christmas celebration that we have every year is about the person of Jesus Christ, that he was who he said he was, did what he said he would do, and I realize he did it for me, and he did it for me because I have a need. This is the part that's not simple. It's easy, but it's not simple. I have to come to a point to where I recognize I have a need in my life, and that need is caused by sin. That's what's not easy for us. We all like to look in the mirror and say, I'm a pretty good person. We all like to look in the mirror and, you know what, I, 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 I think I'm good enough to go to heaven. And we have to be willing to look in the mirror and say, I am not good enough to go to heaven. Because quite frankly, what is good enough to go? What's bad enough not to go? I mean, you put, you put Saddam Hussein at one end of the spectrum and you, you put Billy Graham at the other. How far from Billy is bad enough and how far above Saddam is good enough? That's not the way it works. Je Jesus said none of us can get there except through him. And what makes this so simple is I don't have to adhere to a number of good deeds for a certain amount of time in order to be good enough. A thief on a cross moments before he died found the simple plan of salvation. Jesus, you don't deserve this. You are who you say you are. I'm getting what I do deserve. Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said, today you'll be with me. Don't cut it that close, okay? But it's that simple. But what makes it challenging is we have to admit that we are independent from God and we want to invite him to come live in our life. If we've done that, we're a child of God. So if we've done that, if we've experienced that, and it's based on no merit of our own, good deeds of our own, we can't brag about it. So if we have that, and by having Christ, what that means is I have a home in heaven when I die, whenever that may be. That's God calling. <laughs> and number two, I have Jesus in my life from this moment until God calls me to heaven. So I have a home in heaven when I die, and my life now becomes the home of Jesus in me until I die. So if I have that good news, because that is pretty good news, isn't it? I don't have to face, as, as, as Angela sang in that song just now, my, my trials become what now? I had to go? My trials. Oh, my trials become my blessings. I have someone living in me as I go through my trials that can transform loss into gain and challenges into blessings. And when I die, I go to heaven. And Paul said, where I'm going is better than where I'm leaving. That's good news. It's why 
It's why the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John, that word gospel literally means the good news that Matthew has to share, the good news that Mark and Luke and John have to share. And what was the good news that all four of them shared? The good news was the story of the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All four of them told from a little bit different perspective, one from a Jewish perspective, one from a Greek perspective, one from a physician's perspective. But all of them, they all don't tell it exactly the same because some leave parts out, others include parts. But you know what the part is that all of them have? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because that is the kicker for us. And so if we have this good news and it's real in our life, who would we not want to share the good news with? And so if there's nobody we wouldn't want to have know this same good news as we do, but why then it's the, the vast majority of us as Christians keep it to ourselves? We huddle together, okay? When we've got this incredible story to share with others. And so today we're going to look from another perspective at what uh, what it's like to share this good news. And we're going to look at a a historical event, but it's also a metaphor of sharing this wonderful news with others. Uh, There's an old joke about two fishermen out on a boat. The day was calm and the lake was isolated enough. They were the only fishermen on the water that day. The first man baited his hook and then threw it out in the water and he watched the bobber bob on the waves. And suddenly on the other side of his boat, he heard this terrific explosion on the port side. And in a few moments, there were a few dead fish floating to the surface. He looked over at his buddy as his buddy was frantically scooping up the fish in the net and putting them in the boat. He was about to ask his friend what had happened when he saw his friend light a small stick of dynamite and throw it out in the water, followed by another explosion and a few more fish rising to the surface. And his buddy hollered at his friend and he said, what are you doing? And the guy said, I'm fishing. And the guy said, you can't fish like that. It's illegal. At this point, the friend lit another stick of dynamite, threw it in the lap of his buddy and said, hey, you're going to talk or fish? (laughs) That's a question I want you to think through today. Are you just going to talk about your faith in Jesus Christ? Or are you going to fish with your faith in Jesus Christ? Let's read Luke chapter 5, 1 through 11. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, let me pause right there only to clarify what the lake of Genesaret is, all right? Uh, NIV is the one that translated it this way first, okay? Uh, In your King James, it says something different. It's not a confusion it's of two different places. It's two different names for the same place, all right? So those of you who know your Bible uh, geography, what is the lake of Genesaret? Sea of it is the Sea of Galilee, all right? You say, well, why didn't they call it the Sea of Galilee? Well, way, way back it was called the Sea of Galilee. And then over time, all right, more modern history, it became called the Lake of Genesaret. There is a small community on one side of the lake. This lake is 13 miles long. And on one side of the lake, there is a community, Genesara. And so from that community, it's called the Lake of Genesaret. And one of the reasons it's changed over a period of time is because when you think of a sea, what do you think of? Something like a small ocean, all right? Salt water. This is not salt water. This is fresh water. This is a, a, a natural lake, but it is a fresh water lake. So referring to it as a sea, but yet it's landlocked, is somewhat confusing, all right, in the way in which we're taught geography. So over a period of time, they changed the name of it. But this is what we know as the Sea of Galilee. It's the second lowest um, body of water, lake, in the world. Anybody want to guess what the other lake is that's lower than this one? If you said the Dead Sea, you're correct, all right? Uh, So the two lowest bodies of, of, of natural water is found in this part of the country, and one of them is the Dead Sea, and the other one's the Sea of Galilee, referred to here as the Lake of Genesaret. All right, moving on. With the people crowding around him and listening to the Word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats 
They were left there by fishermen who were now washing their nets. He got into one of the boats and one belonging to Simon and he asked him to put out a little bit from the shore and then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. Kind of peculiar, isn't it? He was teaching them standing on the beach. The crowd kept getting bigger. Jesus saw the boats, got into a boat and said, push out a ways and then he sat down in the boat and he taught. Any reason for that that you can think of? Sound carries better. Exactly correct. All right. Uh, as the crowd got bigger, it was harder for them to hear him farther and farther away. They didn't have sound systems like we have in a church. And so uh, Jesus got in the boat, and now his voice would bounce off the water, and it would amplify to the bigger crowd that was there so that they could hear him better. Pretty smart for the Son of God, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, he kind of created the idea, didn't he? Yeah. Verse 4, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered him, Master, we've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled for their partners in the other boat to come and assist them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. They obviously didn't have a limit on fish that day. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said something most peculiar. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid from now on you will catch men. In the old King James, I believe it says, you will now become fishers of men. So they pulled their boats up onto the shore, left everything, and they followed him. It's probably only been a few weeks since Jesus first met Peter. The Gospel of John tells us that Peter had been first introduced to Jesus by his brother Andrew, and that, I think, is in the second uh, chapter of John. And then in the previous chapter, uh, excuse me, the previous, it was in John chapter 2. And now in Luke chapter 4, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. As I examined these bits of information this past week, I realized something I had never concluded before. And that is up till this time in Luke chapter 5, Peter has just been a part-timer with Christ. He knew Jesus. He'd spent a little bit of time with him, but his relationship with Christ was very casual and very uncommitted. He was kind of like a laid-back pew sitter. That's none of you here today, I'm sure. But folks who just pop in, show up, go home, and there's no thought about Jesus in the in-between times. I could picture Peter listening to Jesus for a while and then going back to tending to his nets. If Jesus had a need of anything from Peter, Peter was more than happy to oblige, but otherwise he would tend to his own netting. That was a play on words, guys. Tend to your own knitting, tend to your own netting. If I have to explain it, that means it wasn't very good. <laughs> if Jesus had need of anything from him, he was ready to respond, kind of like on this day at the lake. Peter and his friends, James and John, probably Andrew there as well, they had been out all night. They had been fishing, and they had failed. Now they're up on the shore, and they're cleaning their nets, and Jesus is teaching some other folks. They're, on the, they're kind of in the side wings, just listening, but taking care of their own stuff. It had been enough of a rough night for them. They had worked very hard, but they hadn't caught a blessed thing. And then Jesus comes, and things get very interesting very quickly. This crowd had gathered to hear Jesus as he preaches. It becomes obvious the growing multitude is getting too big. So this is when Jesus launched out into the boat. Jesus finishes his teaching and, and the crowds go home. It's now midday according to the passage. Jesus turns to Simon Peter and he says, take your boat out into deep water and I want you to let your nets down. Now, there's all kinds of reasons that Peter could have given for not doing what Jesus asked. 
Let me pause there and get personal for a moment. Has Jesus ever asked you to do something and you've had all kinds of reasons why not to? Have you ever thought that he's kind of the instigator behind something going on in your world and, and, and you're saying, well, man, God, I, I can't do that. Peter had reasons. He never mentions them, but I suggest to you they're there. Uh, first off, uh, Jesus is not a fisherman. He's just a preacher. He's a nice guy, but when it comes to fishing, Jesus ought to leave the heavy lifting to guys like Peter and his friends. Secondly, it is the wrong time of day for good fishing. It's right in the middle of the day. It's too hot. Good fishermen know you go early in the morning. You go, you go late in the afternoon to catch the early evening. If you stay out all day, it's just because you don't want to do that list of honeydews at home. Okay? Because you know between these hours, you're not going to catch much. And besides, Peter and his friends were tired. They had been out all night working. Fishing for them was not their hobby it was their job. It was the way they earned their living. And they'd been at it all night, very frustrated. But Peter doesn't belittle or make fun of Jesus over the infringement upon his time. And quite frankly, Jesus isn't the kind of friend you ought to make fun of anyway. But Peter just says, look, Jesus, I've been out all night. I'm tired. But since you've asked me, I'll do it. And Peter puts out to deep water. He lets down the nets. And what happens? Can you imagine Peter letting down those nets? He's saying, what a waste of time. And the next thing he knows, those nets which had been empty all night are full and running over. He can't believe it. There's so many fish in the net that the nets began to break. Peter calls the other men, James and John, to come over and help. They can't handle their nets either. So they call to another boat. Even between them, they have problems because the fish they bring on board nearly swamps both of the boats. Peter and his friends are just astonished at the amount of fish they've hauled in. Peter falls on his knees and notice what he says. The scripture says, Jesus, get away from me. I am a sinner. Isn't that a weird thing to say because you got a net full of fish? I can't guarantee this 100%. I'm reading between the lines a bit here. But what I think Peter is really saying is, Jesus, what are you messing with me for? I have no faith. You asked me to do something. I did it simply out of moral obligation because I like you. I expected nothing. And look what you did. God, I'm not worthy. Get away from me. Hmm. Wonder how many times we've needed to say that. You see, they went from talking about Jesus to fishing with him. Because what Jesus said to them is, Don't get away from me. Jesus said, What you've seen in your career, I want to do for your life. You've been fishing for fish, I now want you to go fish for men. What Jesus really says to them there in that closing verse is, hey, you guys just going to talk or you're going to fish? You're going to talk or you're going to fish? Essentially, that's the question that Jesus puts to Peter, Andrew, James, and John. He knew they had regarded him as a pleasant diversion in their lives. They were comfortable when Jesus was around. They had probably even spent some time, kind of like at a Bible study, while they were cleaning their nets, discussing his teachings. They liked Jesus. But up until that day, they'd been all talk. And on this day, Jesus challenges them to action. He challenged them to a different kind of fishing they've never done before. And when the day was done, they had to answer the question, are we just going to talk about Jesus or are we going to fish with him? I think God might be asking all of us the same question these last few months. Simon, his brother Andrew, and their business partners were professional fishermen. But now they were going to do a different kind of fishing. Jesus said, follow me. From now on, you'll catch men. They were caught by Jesus so that they in turn could go out and catch others. And in much the same way that you and I have been caught by Jesus when we gave our life to him, he now wants to catch others through us for himself. 
What a wonderful, tremendous privilege this is. Not just that we have been caught, that is a blessing, but that we get to join Jesus and others in catching more. We follow him so we can join his work, this incredible work that God has. He's saving others from themselves and their own destruction, and he's doing it by his grace for his glory. Well, what's amazing is that he uses people like you and me to help accomplish sharing this good news with family and friends and neighbors and even strangers. And how can we do that? I think there's some things we can learn from this fishing metaphor in Luke chapter 5. In fact, I think we're supposed to learn some things from this fishing metaphor. To think diligently about what it means and about how evangelism, sharing our faith, is like fishing. Think about this. Jesus gets on a fishing boat with a fisherman to do a fish miracle, all leading towards a fishing metaphor. He clearly wanted Simon to think about this word picture and then to live it out. And I believe he recorded this for us so that we can think about it. Let's draw a few comparisons. I trust, I trust these comparisons are legitimate and you don't think them trite. But in what ways is evangelism kind of like fishing? Four or five observations. Number one, first off, fishing requires going. You can't fish from your living room chair. You got to go. Obviously, this is simple, but it's often overlooked. A fisherman needs to get into the water where the fish are. Once a fisherman has gone out into the water, he then needs to put down the nets, cast out his line. Sitting in the boat, bobbing on the waves, doesn't get it done. He needs to cast out into the waters. And in that way, we need to go where people are. We need to let them know about Jesus. We need to go and we need to let out the net of the gospel. I think sometimes our evangelism is like fishing for tuna in a trout pond. We're very poorly prepared, all right? We have all the wrong stuff. We've got to go where the people are. I, uh, I did a memorial service. Oh, it's been probably a year and a half, two years ago for a, a gentleman. And his, his number one hobby, in fact, his only hobby was fishing. His family, every story they told about him was connected to fishing in some form or fashion. And I remember after they got through telling me about, man, how he loved to fish, I, I asked the next logical question, what were, what were his favorite fishing holes? In unison, five members of his family all said the same thing at the same time. They all said, water. <laughs> he didn't care, man. If there was water, he was going to get a line wet, all right, because he loved to fish so much. Secondly, fishing requires expertise. And by that, I don't mean we necessarily have to be professionals, but we got to learn a little something about what we're wanting to catch. A skilled fisherman learns about fish so he can use the right bait, the right line, go fishing the right time of day. You and I need to consider, be thoughtful. What is the best and most effective ways to, pe to reach the people around us? Sometimes our evangelism is like fishing for tuna in a trout pond. We, we aren't using the most effective ways. Sharing the gospel is about more than just learning and reciting a generic presentation. It's about knowing people. It is about loving people. It is about serving people. It is, about, it is about helping them get to know the reason that our life is the way that it is. And it's about our life being lived in such a way that people want to know the reason that our life might be different. It's why Peter said later on in one of his epistles, he said, be ready to give every man an answer for the hope that lives within you. So we ought to be living a life that is filled with hope. But the better we know others, the better we can share the gospel at their deepest need. We can listen carefully and then address particular questions, griefs, misconceptions, and challenges. Uh, third, fishing requires um, a sense of patience and diligence. Um, my grandpa McLean was not a very good fisherman. My dad is a very good fisherman. My grandpa McLean is not. I, my grandpa McLean died when I was 10. But one of my very vivid memories of my grandpa McLean was fishing out at Mendota Slough. And he had gotten a new rod and reel, and I'm on the bank near him, and he's giving me instructions, and he's casting his line out. And, 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 and as he was casting, it backlashed on him, and he got a, got a nasty net of, of, of line all tangled up there, and he... 
he tried again and it did the same thing. And about the third time that it backlashed on him, my grandfather, the preacher, all right, he took that pole. There was a rock right there. He beat it on the rock and then he threw it out in the lake. And he said, that's the last time that Popeye thing will do that. And, <laughs> and that was the end of his fishing, all right, that day. And I, yeah, he, um, he didn't have the patience nor the diligence in that kind of fishing. Now, he was a master at leading people to Christ. I run into people, I run into people in the most unusual places who tell me, it was your grandfather, George McLean, who led me to Jesus Christ. Sometimes it was preaching. Sometimes it was just visiting in their homes. But God gave him that particular gift. I think I shared not long ago the story of the gentleman at Clovis. I was asked to serve for Dry Creek on a multicultural committee. And there was a big Choctaw Indian who was the chairman of that committee. And uh, when he introduced himself as a full-blooded Choctaw Indian, when that was over, I walked up to him and I introduced myself and I said, we might be related. And he said, why is that? And I said, well, and I pull out, I said, I'm a card-carrying Choctaw. I'm not full-blooded, but I, I got enough to be on the rolls. And he looked at me and smiled and, and, and um, he wanted to know what I did for a living. I said, well, I'm a pastor at a church down the road. And, and, and he, said, um, he said, you know, he said, I... I have fond memories of a Choctaw Indian preacher. He said, when I was 10 years old, there was this preacher who used to come to the reservation that I grew up on in Oklahoma. And every year he would preach a weekend revival. And he said, at one of those revivals, when I was 10, I went forward and gave my life to Jesus Christ. He said, I still walk with Jesus today. He said, I'll never forget that man's name. His name was George McLean. I pulled out my wallet and I handed him my license and I showed him my name, which is Tim McLean at Roland. And I said, George McLean was my grandfather. Now this is 50 years later, 40, well, 40 years later at the time from when that had happened. And yet God honors. You see, fishing requires diligence. We need to structure our days around this privilege and this task. And in some way, we need diligence in sharing our gospel. It's not enough to just hope that opportunities come along. I think we need to plan and create and embrace the opportunities that we can, can see to tell others about Jesus Christ. Fourth, fishing depends upon providence. Most fishermen call this luck. But for our sake, I want to stick to the word providence at the end of the day, the fisherman makes his plans. He goes out, he casts, he uses every bit of expertise that he's got, and yet he knows what happens next is really beyond him. Sometimes he'll make a huge catch. Sometimes he will catch nothing. God will use us to share the gospel, but he's the one who must bring the conviction and the repentance and the salvation in the life of another person. Our task is to be thoughtful, creative, prayerful, and obedient in sharing the gospel and then leave the results to him. We're not trying to force somebody. We are trying to lead somebody, encourage somebody to come to know that Jesus is important and he's a difference maker in their lives. I think part of the challenge is it's really hard to get enthusiastic about fishing when you believe that there's no fish in the lake. You see, we require a certain amount of confidence, not in ourselves, but in the process. If we don't think there's any fish in the lake, then we don't want to go fishing. And that's where Simon was in this story. He was convinced there was nothing to catch at midday after he'd been out at prime fishing times. But God knew there was a tremendous haul awaiting Peter. And I wonder if we can think that way when we share the gospel. We hesitate because we are convinced that God is not really going to do anything. We hesitate because we aren't convinced that it's actually God's joy and delight to save the lost. Our hesitation is based on a total misunderstanding. I would even suggest to you a blasphemous misunderstanding of God's character. We've got to believe that God loves to save the lost and that he hasn't yet caught all of those who are going to be his. Simon was convinced of scarcity. No fish in the lake, but God wanted to show him abundance. So many fish in the lake. And you and I need to approach this idea of sharing our faith with optimism rather than skepticism, with faith in the character and the promises of God. Do you see it? In these ways and probably many, many more, evangelism really is like fishing. Last Sunday, just so you know, 
Last Sunday's sermon was a little different. It was addressed more to those who might want to receive Christ. And I gave time for folks to invite Christ in their life at the end of each of the services. And last Sunday, we had five men and women raise their hands saying, I've invited Christ to come live within my life. One of them I know is somebody who's just been attending three weeks here at New Hope. I'd never met them before last Sunday. They invited Jesus Christ. I, I was fishing. I'll be honest, even though today's message is not targeted for folks who don't know Jesus, it's targeted the vast majority of you that I know are here that when you leave from here, you'll want to go fishing today. But I got news for you. If you're here and you don't know Christ, I'm trolling for you right now. I think I've shared enough in this context to let you know that Jesus loves you. He wants to forgive you of, of your sin. He wants to come live in your life. He wants to assure you of a home in heaven. And he wants to assure you of his presence in your life. Between now and then, I'm trolling. And throughout our lives, not just in church services, we need to understand what kind of... You fish one way in a lake, you fish a different way in a stream. You'll fish one way on the job. You'll fish a, a, an, another way in your own home. But you got to know your audience. You got to know the folks that you're reaching out to, the folks that you'll, you, you got to, you know, I, one of the best fishing trips I ever went on, I didn't know I was going to go fishing. I was caught by surprise. I went fishing. There'll be opportunities that will catch us by surprise. We need to go fishing. Let me wrap this up. There's something even more significant, I think, than this metaphor of comparison between fishing and, and sharing our faith. I think there's something more significant that happened to Peter that day than just catching a boatload of fish. Something so significant that it caught the attention even of his friends. And what I think happened that day is Peter changed how he thought about himself. You see, up until this time in Peter's life, having a net full of fish had been Peter's biggest goal. Having a net full of fish was how he measured happiness and success. His whole life was centered around his boat and his time on the water. But now he's got the biggest net full of fish he's ever had, and he realizes this isn't what's going to make him happy. Do you realize the Scripture says he left it all? the net full of fish, and he walked away. On the day that he made his biggest haul that he's ever made in his life, what does Peter do? He falls on his knees at the feet of Jesus. And then he leaves the nets and the boat and the lake to follow a new passion. It was at this moment he realized how empty his life had been. He declares himself to be a sinner because he's wasted his life. And he realizes how empty his life would be without Jesus. Peter decided at that moment that he could not live without Christ in his life. He decided his life would lack meaning if Jesus weren't the center of all that he said and did and was. He decided to go beyond the casual relationship to a life-consuming relationship. All because he made one crucial decision. And so for the question for us this morning as we get ready to leave is, what have you decided? What have you decided? Are you going to talk or fish? Many of you have already decided to make a chief goal in your life, to be a fisher of others. Many of you have decided that you're going to do whatever you can to create an atmosphere in your life and your world where people will feel welcome to ask questions about Jesus. Uh, but, but some of you you're still hiding the fact that you're a believer. You have not come out of the closet yet. And I'm not sure why. As I just heard from somebody the other day, everybody else is coming out of the closet. I'm not sure why Christians aren't. <laughs> we ought to be able to share our faith. Just like Peter, you can change your life by one decision. Trust Jesus. Launch out into the deep. Let down your net. Talk to somebody about who Jesus is and then see what God does in your life. There's another metaphor in the scriptures to talk about sharing our faith. This was a fishing metaphor, but there's one for farmers. Some plant. Some water. 
but it's always God who gives the increase. I, I got to be honest, I like the fishing metaphor better because when you catch a fish, you know it. But that's selfish. God wants us to understand what, whatever metaphor we're using that if we plant and somebody else comes along and waters, don't worry about the outcome. I'll give the increase. We're to sow precious seed. We're to sow the love of Christ in the way in which we live and deal with others. Are you willing to go fishing? Are you going to be content just to be on the sidelines and talk? We have the greatest news in the world. If we don't, then stop coming to church. Do you get my, and I don't mean, I don't mean that harshly, but if, 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 if this isn't any more than just a Sunday gathering for you, if this isn't a daily, weekly, moment by moment love affair with Jesus Christ and you want to share it with somebody else. I mean, our music is good, but it ain't that good to waste a Sunday morning on if this is all it's going to be is just an hour and a half on Sunday morning. There's a whole lot better communicators than this guy you could sit at home and troll through your TV channels. But what this gathering is about is about challenging us in our daily walk with Jesus, about maturing in our faith. None of us are perfect. None of us are without blemish. None of us are at a point that somebody couldn't look at us and say, you think I'm going to do what you do because you're so perfect? We can say, heck no, man, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm better than I was yesterday, and I'll be, be I'll be better tomorrow than I am today because of what Jesus is doing in my life. If we can't find a way for each of us, this, this responsibility is not just for the church hit men. It's not for the pastoral staff and the Sunday school teachers. This is a call that God has made to every one of us. Let's engage about sharing. Find a way to ask some bunny to come to church with you on Easter Sunday morning. Invite somebody to go to a grief share class with you who has had a, a huge loss. Invite somebody to come to a celebrate recovery meeting because they've got hurt habits or hang-ups that are pulling their life down. Invite somebody to come to, a, to an auction for a mission trip. Not much preaching is going to go on that day but they'll see how God's people care for God's mission. Find ways to engage your faith with those you love. Let's pray. And if you're here today and you've never invited Christ in your life, though you haven't heard the most tintillated sermon about inviting Christ in your life, you've heard enough about who Jesus is, why don't you invite him in right now? Our Father, we love you. Thank you that you are the difference maker in our lives. Father, every week, the challenge for those of us who are pastors is to take the, the scriptures, a book that is thousands of years old, and connect it to life and make it relevant for daily living. And Father, what Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, as I get older and as I do this more and more, I am more convinced how right and accurate he was. Paul said, preaching seems to others as foolishness. But to those who believe, <laughs> it's life-changing. And so, Father, help us not to think how foolish we may look. But Father, let's fish. Whether it's in a water pond in front of an Irish bar or whether it's in the, the lake of Genesaret. Whether we are casting our nets of faith to members of our own family who live in our own home or we're casting them across the street or in our workplace or in our places where we enjoy our hobbies. Let us, Father, realize that there are fish that you want to catch, and you want to use us to catch them. 
And Father, if there's a man, woman, or young person here today that is prepared to invite you in their life, I trust they'll respond very positively at this moment. Lord Jesus, I want to do what Peter did that day. I've, I've heard enough to know that you are who you say you are, and I want to give my life to you. I don't want you to run from me, but Father, I want you to come live in me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. And thank you that you did, dear Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go have a wonderful afternoon. Go fishing. <laughs>